Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's good to be here with y'all this morning. I see a lot of familiar faces. Rebecca and I really miss being here. Uh, we've heard some really good things that are going on at the church. Uh, people being saved, going to church, people stepping up in roles of leadership. Uh, I'm reminded pretty often every time I talk to Cliff Swafford, he says, yeah, the men's group doubled after you left. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. You know, Cliff will always build you up whether you want it or not. But it's great to be here. Uh, Pastor Greg called three or four weeks ago and said he and John were both going to be out of town. Would you mind coming and speak? And I said, we'd be glad to. He said, by the way, we're going through the, the book. I am a church member. And he said that week, happens to be a section on praying for spiritual leaders. I said, well, that's good. God's got a sense of irony for, for the last eight or nine weeks. We've been going through a series of prayer in our Sunday school uh, at First Baptist Decatur. <coughs> then two weeks ago, our, our pastor started a series on prayer during the morning service, and at night we're going through a series on the prayer-shaped disciple. I said, okay, God, I get it. My prayer life is not what it needs to be. So as I speak to you this morning, it's really I'm preaching to myself because God has revealed to me, don't your prayer life's not that good. Uh, if you want to be honest with you, it's pretty weak, so you need to work on it. So we're going to look at some things this morning, and y'all are going to kind of feel like this is Bible drill, but you don't have to flip to every scripture. I'll, I'll read them. But if you will, brush your Bibles, turn to Colossians, the fourth chapter. I want to read verses 2 through 4 as we begin this morning. Paul writes these words. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Pray with me. Father, we just thank you for a beautiful day you've given us. God, we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that we have together in your house this morning. Father, I pray that the words of our lips and the meditations of our heart are pleasing in your sight, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> in his book, The Prayer, si Prayer Shield, Peter Wagner states the most underutilized source of spiritual power in churches today is intercession for Christian leaders. He further states there's no question which exists in the minds of these who have experienced it that committed, faithful intercession brings increased spiritual power to Christian ministries. John Wesley was often quoted as saying, God will do nothing on earth except in answer to believing prayer. You and I can determine what happens to our church leaders blessing or cursing by our fervent prayer or the life thereof. Whether they experience the power of God released in their ministries or if sin and Satan is permitted to influence their ministries. That falls on us through our prayer or the life thereof. Samuel Chadwick wrote, The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. Satan laughs at our toll, mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. He trembles when we pray. Charles Spurgeon said, I know of no greater kindness than my people to pray for me. Every wise church leader seeks and cherishes the prayer support of his people. You know, the Apostle Paul, in 13 of the epistles he wrote, he began those epistles by saying, My brethren, I pray for you. In five epistles other than the Colossians that we just wrote, he also said, Would you pray for me? In Romans chapter 15, verse 30, Paul said, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. In Ephesians 6, 18, Paul said, Praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, 
being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints, and for me, the utterance may be given to me that I may openly open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 1, Paul said, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. In Hebrews 13, 18, he said, Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, he simply said, Brethren, pray for us. We need it. Pray for us. I want to look at three things this morning, three basic points. Number one, why should we pray for our spiritual leaders? Then secondly, we'll look at how or what should we pray for our spiritual leaders. And thirdly, when we honestly, sincerely, fervently pray for our leaders, what happens? Look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. If you want to flip over there, if not, I'll read it. It says, the words of Samuel wrote these words, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me, that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Samuel says it's a sin not to pray for our leaders. We need to pray. Anybody like to go bowling? I know y'all do. You ever noticed or thought about how the pins are set up kind of in a triangular formation? Go to that next slide here. You would think. The front pin we call the pin pin, king pin or the lead pin or the head pin, whatever you want to call it. But our goal is to roll the ball down the lane and hit that king pin, is it not? And then scatter the rest of them. That's the same goal that, that, that Satan has a lot of times. But you've got to be careful how you do that, do you not? If you roll the ball straight down the middle and you hit the king pin straight on, sometimes it'll leave you with a split. It'll leave you with a mess. Rebecca's dad was 86 years old uh, the last time we were following. And, excuse me, we figured out one day he started when he was 16, so he's been following for 70-something years. But it was funny to watch him. We took him, uh, I don't know, five or six months before he passed away, and he'd kind of shuffle up there to the, to the deal, and he'd pick his ball up, and then he'd shuffle a little further, and he got to where he wanted to. He'd stand straight up. And he could take that ball and throw a hook, and it would go right out to the edge of the lane, and then he'd come in and get in the pocket. And he'd hit that pocket. The last time we took him, he scored like a 215. I mean, he shamed all of us. Brent went, Rebecca went, I went. He, he put us all to shame. And that's kind of what Satan wants to do. He wants to hit that pocket. He wants to blindside our spiritual leaders. If he can do that, then he can hit a strike. He can scatter all those pins and he can basically destroy the ministry that's going on in our church. First Peter 5 8 tells us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy church leadership. I want to look at some other reasons we should pray for our spiritual leader. Again, 1 Thessalonians 5 25 says, Brethren, pray for us. It is God's will for us to pray for our spiritual leaders. It's a privilege that God has given us to pray for people. It's a privilege. It shouldn't be a burden. It should be something that we want to do because they need it. God wants us to come into fellowship with Him so that we can call on the power of heaven to exist on earth. God's already got it all lined out. All He wants us to do is ask for it according to His will. Secondly, it's the only way for spiritual leaders to fulfill their accountability to God. We have to pray to, for them for them to fulfill their accountability to God. James 3 1 says, Not many of you should become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. God holds our spiritual leaders to a higher standard, a higher degree of accountability. You say, well, what's that got to do with us praying for them? We need to pray for them that they will fulfill the role that God's called them to. They need our prayers to do that. 
Flip over to Luke chapter 22 with me. In Luke chapter 22, a great example of why it's important for us to pray for our spiritual leaders so they can resist temptation. They're vulnerable. Now, I'm not saying that spiritual leaders succumb to temptation in a greater extent than, than anyone else, but they have a greater amount of temptation thrust at them. Why? Because they're in roles of leadership. Satan again wants to take out the kingpin. But look in chapter 22. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. He says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall crow this day, shall not crow this day before you deny me three times. He said, Peter, you're going to say you don't even know me. But he said, I pray that your faith not fail you. He's not saying that you're not going to deny me. He says, I pray your faith may not fail me. Because he knows that sooner or later, Peter will be restored. And it goes hand in hand with John chapter 21 on that Sea of Galilee, the shores of the Sea of Galilee, when Jesus restored Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? He restored Peter. And Peter went on and strengthened the brethren. We need to pray for our spiritual leaders so that they will not succumb to the temptations of Satan. Because he does seek to seek to destroy them. Why should we pray for our spiritual leaders? It's essential because of their visibility and influence. If Satan can start some kind of gossip, he can start some kind of rumor and destroy their credibility, he's been successful. If he can destroy their credibility, in the community, then those unbelievers say, I told you that preacher down there first, but I just wasn't any different than anybody else. That's what Satan wants to do. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, Samuel says, Now therefore, here is a king who you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the King who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. Now when we look at Saul, this is the king he's talking about, we look at Saul and we say, man, he failed miserably. And he did. But have you ever thought about maybe the reason Saul didn't do so well is because when God allowed Samuel to anoint him as king, the people of Israel turned their back on God. They weren't praying for Saul. So Saul went south. It can happen in our churches the same way. We need to pray for our spiritual leaders that they are blessed by God and our churches will be blessed by God in turn. Lastly, it's essential that we pray for our spiritual leaders because it's crucial for the effectiveness of their ministry. In Jeremiah chapter 32, the Lord came to Jeremiah. He told him to go in chapter 31 and buy this piece of land. But he'd already told Jeremiah, he said, I'm going to destroy Jerusalem. I'm going to destroy it. It'll be wiped out. But Jeremiah went ahead and bought this piece of land that he told him to because the Lord said to him. Jeremiah doesn't understand all the ins and outs of what this, why this is going on, but he understands one thing. He says, Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Jeremiah understood that God was in control, and whatever God had brought forth, he was going to call us to come to pass. We have to believe that whatever God has put in the life of First Baptist Singer, and other churches he will bring to pass. But he wants us to seek his will in that. To seek his will for our spiritual leaders. And when I talk about spiritual leaders, understand I'm not only talking about the pastor, I'm talking about social pastor, 
youth ministers, deacons, everybody that's in roles of leadership. We need to pray for all those folks. So what should we pray for our spiritual leader? I think first and foremost, we should pray for his relationship with his family. Where does Satan attack most often? He attacks the family, does he not? That's his greatest line of attack. If he can attack the family and destroy the family, then he's won the war. I'm going to share with you some statistics this morning. If you read, uh, I'm a church member, if you read that book, you've already heard these, but these statistics come from the Francis Schaefer Institute of Church Leadership Development. They've been studying pastoral ministry and spiritual leaders in their lives since 1989. So they've been doing this a long time. In their study, they found that 80% believe that pastoral ministry has negatively affected their families. 80% of all the pastors and all the leaders they surveyed think that pastoral ministry has affected their family negatively. 80% of the spouses feel the pastors overwork. 80% of the spouses feel left out and underappreciated by church members. <laughs> Pastors have a rough calling. It's not easy. It's a hard life. We need to pray for them. What do we need to pray? Again, pray for their families. That's Satan's greatest line of attack. Secondly, I think we need to pray for their protection and their deliverance from the, the physical attacks that Satan's going to wage on them. He's going to try to bring stress into their lives. He's going to try to wear them down and break their health down and then attack them further. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 19, Paul said, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul's writing to the Philippians from prison. But he says, I know through your prayer that I'm going to go on and preach. Paul said, I'm not going to wind up staying in this prison. Through your prayer and through the Spirit of Jesus Christ, I'm going to get out of here. He felt that in his spirit. In Acts chapter 12, Herod had killed John, uh, James, <clears throat> James son, uh, brother of John. I'll spit it out in a minute. I'm not proud. I can't talk. James, brother of John. He had killed him. He imprisoned Peter right before Passover and he was planning to kill Peter as well. But if you look in verse 5 of chapter 12, it says, Peter was therefore kept out of prison but constant prayer was offered for him by the church. The church continued to pray. They prayed without ceasing. An angel comes to Peter and he gets him in the side. He says, come on, Peter, we're getting out of here. Let's go. The chains fall off and the angel leads Peter out of the prison. Then he goes to the house and he knocks on the door. The girl Rhoda, the, 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 the servant girl, opens the door and says, that looks like Peter. That can't be Peter. He shuts the door and says, hey, Peter's at the door. The constant prayer of the church got Peter out of prison where he was going to be killed. That's the kind of prayer that we need in our churches today for our spiritual leaders. 90% of the pastors said they're frequently fatigued. Either weekly, sometimes daily. 80% of the pastors and churches today feel unqualified for the calling that they've been called. They feel discouraged. 70% of all pastors fight depression from some time or another. You say, how do you know that? That's what the studies say. You think, think about some of the old time great preachers, C.S. Lewis, Oswald Chambers, Charles Spurgeon, they all suffered from depression. Why? Because they, they felt so inadequate sometimes to do what God had called them to do. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry every month. 1,500 every month. Another 1,300 are asked to step down. 50% of all the pastors surveyed said if they could find something else to do, they would do it. Now, I don't know about y'all. When I read those statistics, it broke my heart. And we wonder why our country's in the shape it's in because 
We're not praying the way we need to be praying for God to bring down the kind of heaven here on earth and supply the needs of the pastors. And again, I'm preaching to Philip because I'm as guilty as anybody in this room. We need to pray. And I know that this is a praying church. Rebecca and I spent several years here. There's many of you guys are prayer warriors. But let's be honest this morning. We can all do a little better, can we not? We can all do a little better. That's what God wants. He wants our very best. Our very best. Pray for the boldness to preach the gospel. Pray for boldness. I know this isn't popular, but I've never been known to be politically correct. Not everybody gets a trophy. We don't have to be politically correct. We need to preach the pure, unadulterated gospel. If it hurts people's feelings, then so be it. But we need to speak truth. We need to pray that our pastors preach the gospel boldly. Look what Paul said in, in Ephesians 6, verse 18. He said, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And for me, the utterance be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I might speak boldly as I ought to speak. God doesn't want us to be meek about speaking the truth. He wants us to speak the truth boldly. We need to understand, back up to verse 12, we don't fight and war against each other. Verse 12 tells us, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, wickedness in the heavenly places. We are in a spiritual warfare, a spiritual battle with Satan. We need to battle that. We need to pray that God would give our pastors and our leaders boldness to speak the gospel in truth. Amen. 72% of the pastors that they survey only studied the Bible when they were preparing sermons. You think about it. If they prepare a sermon for Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, it might take 40, 50 hours. Why? Because I think a lot of times we place pressure on pastors to create this awe-inspiring sermon every Sunday morning. Oh, just, just give me something I've not heard before. Something new, something fresh. God's Word is fresh every day if you spend enough time in it. We need to be challenged with the truth. Finally, we need to pray that our leaders might have a spirit of wisdom and understanding. A spirit of wisdom and understanding. Why? Whose wisdom is better? Would you rather have my wisdom or God's wisdom? <laughs> God's wisdom is much better than ours, is it not? Pray that the Lord will give our leaders wisdom. Isaiah 11, 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Isaiah was talking about the coming Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. We want that same Spirit of counsel, that same Spirit of knowledge and understanding for our pastors, do we not? You know, a lot of times we spend time saying, well, well, if they just did this, if they just ran the program like this, if they preached this message and sang these songs, everything would be good. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We need to be praying that God will give our leaders wisdom to lead the church in the direction He wants it to go. Amen. Not in the direction we want it to go. We need that in our churches today. We need to pray for wisdom. Now, I don't know if this is probably unpopular, but here it is. That's the truth. That's what we need in churches today. We need pastorly wisdom. And finally, we need church relationships. 
Our pastors and leaders need more friendships and less conflicts. More friendships and less conflicts. When Rebecca and I were at the children's home in Mexico, mission teams would come down from the States, and, and a lot of times our pastors would come down with them. And, and I was blessed and privileged to sit down with some of those men, those great men of God, and just talk to them. You know what they wanted to talk about? They just wanted to talk. Just to talk one-on-one -on -one and not have to be asked, How's your church doing? How's things going? How do, what about this preacher? What's this mean right here? They just needed friendships. A little, little break from being pounded with questions and, and, and problems and things that arose. They needed more friendships and less conflicts. You know, some of these guys in roles of leadership deal with more problems in a week than we deal with all year. Where do those problems come from? A lot of times from us. Why? Because we focus on what we want. If we can focus more on the things we agree on than the things we don't agree on, how much better would our church be? Can we not agree on the things that are in God's Word that we agree on and let all that other stuff fall aside? If it doesn't matter concerning the kingdom of God, if it's not building the kingdom, then it's really not all that important. James 31 says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war in your members? A lot of times we just fight about getting our way. As I said earlier, as we read these statistics, it leaves no doubt that we need to be constantly in prayer for our church leaders. Our churches absolutely depend on our prayers. They need more of them. I don't care how much you pray, pray more. Pray for our church leaders. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus said, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. He was referencing Isaiah 56, 7, where God, through the prophet Isaiah said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. God wants us to pray for our leaders. Say, so, okay, Philip, you've told us why we need to pray, how we need to pray. Now, what happens when we pray? What can we expect? When we pray for our leaders, God will send them divine help. Just like He did with Peter. He sent divine help to get Peter out of the situation he was in. Something's going on with our leaders. Instead of getting in our little groups and talking about it and trying to work it out with our wisdom, why don't we hit our knees and pray to God to work it out with His wisdom? It'll happen a lot quicker. Whatever their need is, God will grant them that need when we pray for it. Also, when we pray, God covers our leaders, our pastors, our spiritual mentors, with divine protection. He goes before them. He puts a hedge about them and protects them. That doesn't mean that everything's always going to be great. But He's going to lead them through just like Jesus prayed for Peter. Peter, I pray that your faith may not fail you. He brought him through. When we pray for that divine protection, God will protect physically, spiritually, emotionally, and financially. And He will protect their family and their marriage. Because again, that's where Satan's going to attack. He's going to try to destroy their marriage or their families. When we pray diligently, earnestly, sincerely, God defeats the schemes of Satan against our leaders. Satan is out again to hurt, hinder, ultimately destroy spiritual leaders and then attack the church. Our fervent, sincere prayer can squelch Satan's attacks. And finally, when we pray fervently for our leaders, God will strengthen the church. Have y'all seen that? He's done it here. He's strengthened this church. He'll continue to strengthen this church. But we can't, we can't relax 
When things are going good, what's our natural instinct? Put my feet up on the couch. You know? But we can't do that. We have to pray even harder when things are going well because Satan is trying to get a little toehold. He's working on his hook all the time. He's trying to get that pocket. So we have to get on our knees and pray fervently. Our prayers and our pastors and church leaders will be blessed. Our church will be strengthened. The church that sincerely prays in accordance to God's will can expect God's blessing and divine direction. I believe that with all my heart. You ever heard somebody say, well, all I can do is pray? Really? All I can do is pray? That's the most important thing you can do. That's the greatest tool we have. Your prayers are significant. They make a difference. Oswald Chambers said, the, the prayer of the feeblest saint who lives in the Spirit and keeps right with God is a terror to Satan. The prayer of the, fe of the feeblest saint who lives in the Spirit and keeps right with God is a terror to Satan. Don't you want to be a terror to Satan? I love the to way Tony Evans says it. He says, I want to be a man after God's own heart. I want to be the kind of guy that when I my feet hit the floor in the morning, the devil says, oh crap, I'm back. I want to strike that type of fear in the devil. We all should want to strike that kind of terror in the devil because there's power in prayer. Many of y'all have heard the well-known story. Several college students went to Metropolitan Tabernacle. They wanted to hear Charles Haddon Spurgeon speak. The Prince of the Preachers would call him. Every time you look up something, that's what he's called, the Prince of the Preachers. He was one of the greats, and we still look at his writings. The story goes that these college students arrived at the church, and Spurgeon met them at the door, and he was going to give them a tour. And as they're going around, he's showing them different things, and he says, would you like to see the heating plant? I'm like, what? The heating plant? He said, yeah, the boiler room. They're like, well, I guess so. So he takes them downstairs and he shows them the, the boiler room, the heating plant. And as they walk in the door, these college students see hundreds of people on their knees praying for the service that's upcoming. He said, that's my heating plant. The heating plant was located right under the platform where he stood and preached. And every time he preached, there were people underneath him lifting up prayers to heaven, trying to draw down heaven's power to earth. That's what we need. That's what we need. You say, well, we can't, there's no place to get under here. That's okay. We can do it sitting in this room. If you go down past the conference room and take a left, there's a prayer room down there. Many of y'all have seen the movie War Room. Y'all got a war room. It won't fit a hundred people, but it'll fit several. And can you imagine the power that could be in this place every Sunday morning if there were people praying as Sunday school is going on. It's the first service. There were people down there this morning. We need prayer for our spiritual leaders. And as I said before, I'm preaching to Philip because I understand that prayer is one of the most used resources that we have. We need to pray for our spiritual leaders. We need to pray for this church. We need to pray for protection over our leaders. God has put together a unique team here. The Pastor Grant, Brother John, Ryan, y'all were blessed. A great team. Lift them up in prayer. Lift them up in prayer. Pray that God will work through them to lead this church. He will give them godly wisdom that passes all understanding. And we come to the point of service of this to Time of invitation. I'm going to ask Brother Jerry to come. Play a song of invitation. Maybe you're here this morning. I don't know what the needs of the people are. God does. Maybe you're here this morning. You just want to come down to an old-fashioned altar and, and ask God to work in your life this morning. Maybe you want to come down and pray for your church leaders. Pray for safety. Pray for protection. Pray for somebody that you know is struggling you know, I think a lot of times we, we uh, underutilize this altar. 
to what is false. So let me lead us in a word of prayer, and then Brother Jerry's going to lead us in a song of invitation. Father, we're just so thankful for the privilege of prayer. Father, the power of prayer. Lord, I understand that, that I'm pretty weak in my prayer life a lot of times. There's a lot of things that you want to do through our prayers that we just kind of let slip by because we don't take the time. We, we don't think it's important. We don't think it'll make a difference. What can one prayer do? God, there's power in praying to a righteous, holy God to bring down heaven's power to earth. Father, my prayer this morning is that we would utilize the tools that you've given us. The power of prayer. Father, I pray that if there's one that's here this morning that does not have a relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit will prick their heart this morning. They'll come down and receive you as their personal Savior. Father, help us to honor you in all we do. Give us opportunities this week to, to share the love of Christ with those who come in contact with. And we'll be careful to give you glory and honor and praise for all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand in the middle of your sleep.